when a war starts, and you can go back all the way back to the Crimean War when the modern war correspondent was invented, courtesy of the telegraph, that mythic narrative about war, war is boys' adventure with heroism and glory, that sells newspapers and it boosts ratings. Real war reporting does Nobody, unless they've been in a war, has ever seen war. Because if you saw it, it would be so repulsive and so disgusting, you have to turn away. Every report that comes out of war is not only sanitized and self-censored, even the images that you get, however shocking they may appear, do not come close to what it's like to see somebody have their legs blown off and spend six hours bleeding to death in the sand. Not only could you not watch it, but what you get in wartime is that collective psychosis, that disease of nationalism, which affects everybody, including the media. And people want the myth. They want it. And the press gives it to them. That's how we got Norman Schwarzkopf. It's how we got Jessica Lynch. It's how we got the, the, the complete fabrication of Pat Tillman's death. Not, and, 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 and journalists are aware of that. And I've covered conflicts such as the former war in the former Yugoslavia, where American forces were not involved. And the kind of reporting that I would do when I would go into a town was very different from the kind of reporting my Muslim colleagues would do, because they would play to the myth. They would look for those refugees who were liberated and free. They would find the hometown hero who gave children candy. Uh, they would look for the perfidious crimes of the enemy. And as Paul pointed out, the press, with very few exceptions, and it is a matter of courage, is a reactive force. I mean, the whole story about how the press lost Vietnam is a lie. The press only began to report the truth about Vietnam when the poll numbers made it possible for them to report the truth. And I think you're seeing the same thing with the war in Iraq. So um, that, that myth, that disease of nationalism, of blind patriotism, which is really a form of self-exaltation, has a powerful effect and infects an entire society, including the press. Don't you have to be willing to lose your job to tell the truth? Now, you just said we could have done this stuff with Peter Jennings. And you could have. You could have shown that Dick Cheney claiming that Muhammad Atta was in Prague was a fabrication, that there was no evidence underlying the assertion. Later on, when Dick Cheney lied about it, uh, lied about ever even saying that it was pretty well confirmed, Network News never covered it, because I followed the story. John Stewart was the first person four days later to run one clip against the other. Now, here's the Vice President of the United States at one time saying it's pretty well confirmed, and then later saying, I never said it was pretty well confirmed. All you had to do was get the tape and put them side by side. Tim, I waited for Tim Russert on Sunday to do it. But Tim Russert isn't willing to lose $3 million. Uh, Chris Matthews knew that this was fabricated because every once in a while he would pop up and say it on hardball and then I'd see him start to wet his pants. Now he's having a field day. This isn't news that he's giving us now. It's a history lesson. We needed it three years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think you make a good point. Um, and it, and it is, it's fear. It's careerism. It's, um, you know, people, reporters spend 10, 15 years trying to get into the newsroom of the New York Times. And they don't want to lose it. They're scared of losing it. And they, it's, it's a Faustian kind of deal where um, um, you don't want to risk your job. I think that cowardice, I think Paul hit it on the head. I think cowardice is, is a big problem. And this is why I have no right to actually be on this panel, because uh, I've always been in this uh, totally unfair situation of having another job. If you think of Washington as Versailles, which is what I, I talk about in the in the book, uh, it's easier to understand. It's not just fear, it's also they love being in Versailles. They like being close to power. It's, they love the, the canapes at the diplomatic uh, receptions at the White House. 
uh, at dinners and so on and so forth. They like being there. And if you're from Akron or, or Chicago like I am or uh, any number of, uh, of uh, lesser metropolises, you think it's really great to be in Washington close to power or in New York close to the, the financial power. And, but again, once again, if the publishers wanted courageous journalism, if they wanted courageous journalists, they're all over the place, they can hire them. They can even, they can even encourage the not so courageous ones to be better, and they don't. They don't have any interest in it. But I, but I think that's, that's why journalism is, is really a calling for the best journalists. I mean, I think Chris is an excellent example of that. You do have to be willing to lose your job. You do have to be willing to take risks. But I'm not sure that's new. I mean, I don't know that it was ever that much different or that much better. I think all you have is more places where you can take those kinds of risks or not to. Gentlemen, over on the far side, we'll make this the last question. You've had your hand up for ages. I'd just like to ask you one question. You seem to be um, saying that uh, the war in Iraq is unnecessary. That's just your belief. <laughs> Are you trying to tell me Judith Miller, the president, all these people just made up all this information. Yes. 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 That's what we're trying to tell you. If he had the weapons, what would you have done then? Is the war in Iraq if, necessary? Is the war ne if, what I'm saying to you is you're a public you're a journalist. You're supposed to be giving the news. Instead, you're giving me your opinions, which is fair enough, but that's what you're doing. All right. And uh, to me, right, let me, let me can I just say something real quick, really quickly before? Do you know that the reason for going to war in Iraq, all 21 of these journalists together, have, there is no consensus among them about why we went to war in Iraq. However, <coughs> if you ask the journalists in here who have worked in Iraq, there is a consensus over Iraq. What do you suppose it is? Um, I spent seven years in the Middle East as the Middle East Bureau Chief for Times, many of those years, and speak Arabic, and spent a lot of time in Iraq. I was in the first Persian Gulf War, um, and then hung around after the war, watching the UN inspection teams decimate the Iraqi military arsenal, including biological and chemical agents that were stored in artillery shells. Um, no one who spent any time in Iraq, especially if they covered as I did, week after week, month after month, the complete denuding of the Iraqi military believed that Iraq was a threat to its neighbors, much less to us, number one. <laughs> number two, Can you prove that? Yeah. yeah, because I was there when they destroyed it. I was there when they destroyed it. I, I, I was there when they destroyed it. And um, Iraq, the Iraqi military was a pale shadow of what it had been in 1991. It, it was absolutely decimated. The regime was isolated. The tragedy of the war in Iraq is that the policy of containment was working. The same policy that, of course, Kennan formulated during the Cold War that was essentially applied to Iraq was successful. And what this administration did was take a successful policy with this dictator, Saddam Hussein, withering on the vine, his own series of assassination attempts, the day his son was crippled, um, you know, he was drifting off into outer space, sitting in his palaces writing novels. The, the country was unraveling, and we took a successful policy and what turned the entire Muslim world, one-fifth of the world's population, most of whom are not Arabs, along with much of the rest of the world, against us. And, and what is most important, and this is a lesson I learned from covering the war in El Salvador and the war in Algeria, is that counterinsurgency campaigns are primary political wars. Fighting terrorism is, a, is an intelligence or a political war. It's not a conventional war. And the only way to win it is to isolate those radical groups within their own societies. And I was in the Middle East after 9-11, and we had gathered the empathy, not only of Europe, but most of the Muslim countries in the Middle East. And I watched week after week as we squandered it all. And we took a group that after these attacks, and these attacks genuinely shocked the Muslim world, we turned them from pariahs into heroes. And now we're paying the price for it.